So, um, I'm going to be talking to you today about my uh, a project that I've been working on with the team, mostly out of ASU, but at a variety of places, on our South African Paleoscape model. Um, so first, a little background into uh, this question and why it's, why it's important. Some of you may not have taken a paleoanthropological class in a little while, or a human origins class. There hasn't been a lot of paleoanthropology at this conference, actually. Um, so South Africa is the context of the origin of modern humans, both sort of behaviorally and biologically. Um, we're talking about sort of origins of modern cognition, cognitive capacity, um, early stages of cumulative culture really kind of taking off as, as a key to our adaptation, hypersociality as well. These things together form um, what our grant application is titled, The Origins of Human Uniqueness. Um, so a very important time in the world uh, for our species. All of this, of course, is wrapped around this um, interaction between uh, humans and their environment, both in terms of the evolution of behavior and biology. Um, to tackle all of this very lofty question, we have a, a very large, actually, international and interdisciplinary team involving, uh, I've lost track of how many individuals. So the stage for all of this and, and for my model is coastal South Africa, um, uh, particularly around the area of Pinnacle Point. Um, a pinnacle point in South Africa in the Middle Stone Age. So Pinnacle Point um, begins uh, its habitation phase about 164,000 years ago, is continuously occupied up until 40,000 years ago. Um, it is the site of the earliest use of ochre in the archaeological record, presumably for some sort of symbolic expression uh, type of purpose. Um, also the earliest use of shellfish as a kind of key resource in the human diet. Shellfish, of course, you've got to kind of plan for that. You have to understand the tidal cycle and things like that to um, uh, exploit it uh, properly. Heat treatment of lithics, microlithics uh, for making compound, compound hunting weapons. All of these are kind of key markers in the emergence of um, uh, modern cognition. Uh, Blombo's Cave and Classy's River Mouth, uh, you may have heard of those sites as well. They're all in the sign of uh, same little strip of South African coastline. So where do we actually start out with this? Well, we have um, a very, our paleoscape simulation project is much larger than just my component. We begin with um, global climate models on the left there, um, these things running on supercomputers, uh, trying to reconstruct the climate in both glacial and interglacial phases. Um, this is then piped into a vegetation model that predicts what the sort of distribution of different habitats were on this landscape in these different time periods. That then turns into kind of resource landscape for uh, the agent-based modeling, which is where I come in in this last stage. Okay, before I get to what my model actually is, I just wanted to quickly sort of emphasize that this foraging model, this sort of simple human foraging system, has sort of turned into an underlying base, agent-based modeling type in archaeology because it's relevant for so many different research questions. It's relevant for settlement patterning, uh, modeling mobility, modeling dispersal at the sort of regional and global scale as well because of course why do you move? You move for resources. Um, I argued that ad nauseum in my PhD dissertation and I will skip over that here. Um, it's also, of course, relevant for understanding behavioral and biological evolution because this is our interface with the environment. We exploit the environment. We are constrained by the environment. Um, if you get a little more specific, it is also at the root of intergroup interaction. If you have to travel farther to access a resource, you're starting to bump into other groups. So it is the foundation of intergroup interaction, trade, exchange, risk from hunting, all sorts, uh, risk of, of sort of warfare with other groups. Um, all of this means that it is highly important to understand this system well. And it is not a simple system. Um, it is anything but, as I will um, sort of emphasize here. So fortunately, though, there is a well-rounded body of theory known as optimal foraging theory used in both uh, human societies and in animal um, societies, I suppose. Um, and what I'm going to argue here is that optimal foraging theory should be the basis of an agent-based model focused on foraging. It's 
kind of already done for us in a slightly different capacity. So for those of you who don't remember uh, these kind of diet breads, um, uh, graphs, marginal value theorem, and so forth, optimal foraging theory essentially tells us what resources we should harvest, how many resources we should harvest, when we should abandon that resource and go find a new one, um, and it also conveniently tells us um, what types of data we need. And it comes down to two very important things, the calories that we get from the environment from different types of resources, how much food do we get, as well as the time that it takes to do so. All of this sort of amounts to the net caloric um, benefit of different things, times in terms of harvesting, searching, processing, walking, all of those sorts of uh, uh, categories. So how do we model foraging? Well, in archaeology, typically modeling foraging has amounted to a much simpler model. Um, agents pick the best cell out of their local neighborhood, some X amount of sort of perception radius. Um, they move using some amount of energy. They harvest some amount of energy from that environment, and then they repeat around and around and around. This is not exactly lining up well with optimal foraging theory. We need, it's not yet sufficient to sort of be, to be modeling um, uh, foraging. So how do we model foraging better? Well, at the root of it, we need to sort of extract out of optimal foraging theory a good algorithm for well-reasoned mobility and uh, foraging decisions based on the available resources and time uh, in the environment. Complication number one out of this is that, of course, resources are spatially heterogeneous. They're spatially variable. And this is not very surprising, but you need to cope with that. You need to judge where your resources are, how close are they to you, what sort of loss do you take traveling to a distant patch um, and a kind of inverse distance weighting kind of uh, thing for GISE folks. Complication number two is that resources are also temporally variable, both in terms of seasonality for plant resources, for example, but in the case of shellfish, there are also a tidal cycle controlled by the moon that causes sort of extra good uh, low tides and extra not so good neap tides um, in a two week cycle. So in order to be an effective forager, we need to anticipate future returns. You need to know in advance when those resources are going to be there so that you can show up at the right time and not miss it. Complication number three, foragers are social. These are not um, independent individuals wandering through the forest like a polar bear or something, or not the forest, uh, but uh, <laughs> grizzly bear. Let's go with grizzly bear. We're not autonomous individuals. We are um, social. We have to, uh, we mitigate risk by food sharing. We have to come back to a camp at the end of the day. All of this actually can, um, puts costs on us, right? In order to be in a camp at the same location as a bunch of other foragers, there's a loss there because a number of other individuals are, are harvesting resources out of the same area. So there's kind of social costs involved in this as well. All right, so we moved um, the top, uh, well, my left, is that your left too? Yes, it is. Uh, the top left is a habitat map of the South African coast. Pinnacle Point is in the middle there. If you go sort of over to the uh, very left side, you're at Blombo's Cave. You go over to the right, you're at Classy's River. All right, so we classified the landscape into different habitat classes. These are, are modern data, but um, work relatively well for an interglacial phase as well. And then we have been systematically sampling all of the food resources, plant, animal, uh, and uh, shellfish. That guy in the uh, bottom left is carrying an octopus there, if you can't see. We've been systematically um, measuring uh, the returns from all of these different landscapes, both above ground plant resources, below ground uh, underground storage organs uh, for carbohydrates. The top right there is a very large um, sea snail known as turbo. Um, which you can get a ridiculous amount of calories out of for your, for your time spent, the occasional tortoise in there as well. Unfortunately, we don't have mammals yet. We're working on it. Uh, we have people in the field right now working on that. Um, Jan de Vink uh, et al. have published three papers in the last couple of months uh, summarizing all of this data that I will be extracting. All right, so the model itself is built in NetLogo, of course, uh, being the NetLogo evangelist that I am. Um, the habitat types out of that map that you saw a minute ago have been classified down into different patches, uh, more or less representing the different caloric returns that you can get from them. 
We have two different types of agents. Uh, we have camps that sort of make most of the decisions and then little foragers set out from those harvest some resources in return. The majority of the model is the, the sort of code part of it is what I like to call the accounting. They are accounting for time, they're accounting for calories, how many calories does the group get, does each forager get, how much have they extracted from the landscape, all of that sort of number crunching um, part that is not actually so interesting from an archaeological um, uh, sort of human behavioral uh, way. What I want to focus on today is my decision making algorithm that I've been working on, sort of slight variations um, of this algorithm used by camps and foragers just based on the different time scales they're dealing with. All right, so the decision making algorithm. Stay with me here. We have variable return rates across the landscape classified by color. You can see the coastal patches here have a higher caloric return of 100 calories per hour. These are not uh, real numbers, just nice numbers for uh, display here. So step one, you need to account for that spatial variability. If it takes you an hour to travel to the coast, that's an hour that you're not spending harvesting resources. So not only is there an energetic cost of walking, there's a loss because you're losing time, right? So if you stay where you are, you can harvest 60 resources. If you travel to the coast, suddenly you get 500. Um, you lose an hour there, but you're still doing um, quite well. However, the coastal resources are tidally controlled. You can only harvest at low tide, which means if you walk an hour there, you've already lost an hour of that two hour low tide block. And suddenly you are, uh, then you need to spend the rest of your day harvesting terrestrial resources. Suddenly you're down to 140 calories um, net for the day. It's still worth making the trip, but it's not sort of as calorically benefic beneficial as you might uh, expect. For a blue camp, that is a little bit further away, a little bit of a, a longer trek to get over there, it's no longer worth it. They've missed the tide completely because of this three hour trip. Um, at the end of the day, they get 30 calories rather than if they stay put and get 60, right? With me so far? However, if you can anticipate your future returns over a series of days, that three hour travel cost is no longer very important, right? The three hours, is a bit of a loss today, but I know that I'm going to have another four days to harvest those coastal resources. Suddenly I'm up to uh, a much larger uh, number of calories than, uh, than I would have been if I'd stayed put. All right, so this future forecasting changes the, uh, the equation. You do need to factor in this sort of time discounting element. Um, I won't get into the specifics of the equation there, but essentially 500 calories right now is good. 500 calories five days from now, not so good, right? Maybe five days from now, that same 500 calories is only worth 300. There's a, there's a loss in terms of making sure you have what you have right now uh, rather than sort of counting on something in the future. So there's a bit of a, a loss there, and I factor that into um, this little uh, very tiny print um, equation here. Point being, it is not a lot of code. There's about 10 lines of code buried within the much larger model that mostly, as I said, is controlling for accounting. And with this relatively simple algorithm, our agents are able to cope with resource heterogeneity, both spatially and temporally. They're able to forecast return rates into the future um, with a little time get discounting um, bit moved in. Because there's a lot of agents, they are now um, coordinating to a certain extent with the agents in their group. They are cooperating with those agents in terms of food sharing. They are competing with other agents in other camps. Um, all of this is sort of boiled in here. Coming in in the near future, once we get some better data, um, we will also add hunting um, as a sort of alternative uh, food resource as well. When this comes in, they need to balance the risk of uh, failure, essentially not finding the game that they are setting out for against the much higher payoff. Though again, optimal foraging theory tells us how to do that um, and we have a model um, for that as well. It makes the decision making algorithm a little bit more complicated. Even more complicated is that calories are not the only thing you need and not all calories are made equal. You need carbohydrates, you need fats, you need protein. Um, you also need wood for fuel. You need wood for heat treatment of lithics. 
you need lithics to be an effective hunter, you need all of these different things you need to balance in a kind of weighted um, decision-making framework that we are uh, in the process of building. So what does this look like so far? Um, with the caveat that we don't have all the necessary resources in this foraging system yet. Um, on the x-axis, we have the percentage of the diet coming from marine resources. This kind of key thing that we know from the archaeological record at Pinnacle Point was important, but how important and, and in what way. Um, on the y-axis, you have the average calories per person per day. So as that goes down, your proportion of marine resources goes up. So the first thing we learn is that food stress increases when the population increases. That's not so surprising, basic carrying capacity. But as that food stress goes up, you become more reliant on marine resources, which is interesting. It's a more rapidly renewing resource than the plant resources. It takes a long time to grow a tuber. Um, it doesn't take so long for a shellfish to sort of wander up into the intertidal zone. All right, so that's not so surprising. We expected that. What is interesting is that out of these, um, the dot size being the, po the population size, out of a particular population size, sort of one little stripe through the middle, the bluer dots are the ones who are forecasting, the ones who are anticipating future returns. For a constant population size, the forecasters do slightly better, both in terms of their average calories and in terms of um, the proportion of marine resource that they're using. So they are successfully anticipating the tidal returns and sort of benefiting from that, which is cool, which is exactly what I wanted them to do. Um, so I like that. Um, what we didn't necessarily expect was that because the agents are smarter and can better exploit the environment, they overexploit the environment more quickly. So a more intelligent agent actually lowers the carrying capacity of the landscape as a whole. You can have a larger population size for a, a stupid agent than you can for a smart agent, which is interesting. That has very uh, large implications for what we assume in terms of population sizes, group orientation, um, how many people you can fit in there, and the nature of and sort of probability of interaction with other groups. All of this is very, um, very cool and unexpected. Okay, so the takeaway points from this, uh, from this talk today, foraging is an underlying agent-based modeling type, and we need to be better at modeling it. Um, that doesn't mean that all foraging models have to be as empirical and complicated as this one, because we have that underlying mechanism, that underlying decision-making framework that we can then export and put into a simpler model and explore on simulated landscapes and things in much more depth. But it is, it is a sort of underlying type that we should get a lot better at modeling um, in a lot more, a lot of different research questions. Um, foraging as a system, the sort of so-called simple hunter-gatherers are not at all simple. There are very complicated cognitive processes that go into this. Um, Forecasting future return rates, not just for the next tidal cycle, but seasonally. They have to interact with other groups. It is not at all a simple cognitive system. And, and so it is very important to understand what cognition does within a foraging system, especially when we're trying to understand the origins of modern human cognition. <coughs> As I mentioned already, realistic models should not have... Uh, realistic models should not get too bogged down in mechanisms. I mentioned this a couple days ago as well in the panel. There should still be a basic core mechanism underneath that is uh, understandable, that is analyzable. I mentioned that uh, on uh, Tuesday. Yes, you can have a lot of parameters boiled into your model and a lot of different values you need from the empirical record. That doesn't mean that the model is necessarily unanalyzable if you, have a, if you focus on this sort of simple core mechanism. Sort of classic, uh, two different approaches uh, to modeling, hypothesis building versus, uh, or hypothesis generating versus hypothesis testing. We have both of those goals um, uh, in this particular project. We have very specific hypotheses that we want to test that have been sort of proposed from archaeological data, um, looking at the role of population size, group size, 
um, looking at the role of, of prediction in terms of resources, um, the role of marine resources in the diet, um, impact of risk, all of these sorts of things are very specific hypotheses that we will use this model to test. But it has also been a very useful thinking tool. It is helping us to come up with new questions for the archaeological record that we are then actually taking back to the field, collecting different types of data than we were before. Um, Jan, I have been emailing Jan de Vink, our South African colleague, uh, repeatedly telling him, okay, but you haven't timed that right. We need to go back, get your Khoisan foragers and head back to the coast and um, make sure that you have them collect in certain size blocks for a certain amount of time, that sort of thing. Um, this is particularly useful in a very large interdisciplinary project when you have a lot of non-modelers involved. It, it's very useful to sort of go back and forth between the modeling approach and the field workers, um, all sort of talking together in new questions and new uh, research directions. So I will leave it there and I'm happy to take any questions that you, that you have.